<laughs> Welcome back. Welcome to our second hour. This is Grace and Truth Bible Church, formerly known as Portland Bible Church. I'm Pastor Gary Glennie. Thank you so much for joining us once again. Uh, this is a continuation of our Sunday service beginning at 10, and this is 11.15. After our second hour, we have time to sing the great hymns of the church, so we fellowship and worship in song. If you'll join with us, you're certainly welcome to come and be a part of our fellowship here at our home in Vancouver, Washington, if you're in the Portland, Vancouver area. Uh, and also, if you'd like to give to the ministry of Portland Bible Church, you can do that as well. Send your check or money order to this address, but make sure you put Grace and Truth Bible Church on the envelope or the check or money order. We put it right into the box for the men. They take care of all of that. Everything is on the grace basis here at Grace and Truth Bible Church. We also, of course, have a web presence. You can go to portlandbiblechurch.com. We haven't changed the address yet. We'll be working on that. It's in progress, so we can get the Grace and Truth name on our website for folks who are looking at the information. We have about 100-some printed studies that you can use for your own study time or devotion or for Bible studies. And we also, of course, have charts, graphs, maps, outlines, and various categorical developments there as well. And you can go to the website, portlandbiblechurch.com now. And at the top of the homepage, it says services. And there's a drop-down menu. It will link you to YouTube. Or you can go directly to YouTube. And right now, we post those immediately after our classes. But eventually, we'll be able to do that, I understand, live once again. So those are available. And we're still looking at some additional venues to get the information out. But thank you for all those who are listening all across the country and in various parts. Uh, Pastor Bamuleka over in Uganda, high over there. And so we've got a whole church and congregation over there as well. Just some great folks over in Africa and uh, places across the pond. So thank you. Thank you so much for joining with us. Uh, services on Thursday at 7 o'clock. We're studying the book of Ephesians. We're currently in chapter 2 there. And my wife Judy has a class for the ladies right here at our house on Wednesday, currently studying Second Peter, uh, which is a great study. We finished it in congregation, but she's doing a recap now for the ladies in the ladies class. So if you want to join with her, that's Wednesday, 2 o'clock, right here at our house. Remember at Portland Bible Church, Grace and Truth Bible Church, now, uh, we teach the whole Bible, every verse in the Bible, every time, all the time. So again, if you want to study the Word of God, you're at the right place at the right time. And so thank you for, again, joining with us. And uh, we always uh, start each of our Bible studies, as you know, with a time of silent prayer. Most of you understand what that's for, but for the new folks, we understand that we need to have the enabling or filling of the Holy Spirit. We believe the mechanism for that is confession of sins, any sins that the Holy Spirit brings to our remembrance. John tells us in his first epistle, 1 John 1, 9, if we, believers, confess our sins, that is to name them, cite them, agree with God that their sins on a moment-by-moment -moment basis, he, God, is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and at the same time to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We believe this picks up the ones we've forgotten about or didn't know that we had committed, and therefore we have the enabling and fulfill the command to be filled with the Holy Spirit. So, with that in mind, in preparation for our study for this second hour, let us pray. Now, Father, once again, thank you so much for this opportunity to study your word, to assemble together, to be edified of soul, and to worship through the intake of your word and through song. We thank you for the time that you've given to us in freedom in this time frame, historically, and in this nation. We pray that our nation would continue to allow us to have freedom to worship in the way that your word instructs us. We pray now as we study in your word that you'd edify our souls, clarify the principles that we come to, 
and help us to apply them in our life situation as we go out from this place. We thank you for these things and pray that you would edify and strengthen us through your word now, through the power of your Holy Spirit. And we pray all these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. It is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Thou hast magnified thy word above all thy truth. Thy word is truth. Study to show yourself workmen that need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Open, if you will, to the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 30. If you've been with us, we have been studying in the book of Hebrews. We're actually beginning chapter 12 of Hebrews. And there, of course, we have the fact that we are to focus our attention on the Lord Jesus Christ. In the hour just past, we had the communion service, if you were with us. If not, you can go back and listen to that and join us for the communion this morning. And in connection with the communion service, we looked at some passages in Jeremiah 31, actually beginning over there in chapter 31, verse 21, and continuing down through verse, I believe we went through verse 34. And I really ran out of time in the first hour a little bit and ran over, so I was trying to think how I could do chapter 30, 30 and 31 in Jeremiah leading up to this. So uh, reminiscent of those movies from a decade or so ago, Back to the Future, uh, if you saw that trilogy, we're going back to the future and back to the past. And so we're going back about 2,600 years ago to the time of the writing of the book of Jeremiah. And Jeremiah, of course, uh, prophesied between 627 B.C. and about 582 B.C. We don't really have much information as to his death. Some believe he ended up going down to Babylon. Others do not think that he ever went to Babylon uh, because Daniel and uh, others went to Babylon. Uh, Ezekiel and Daniel went to Babylon, but Jeremiah did not. He stayed in the home front and continued to prophesy up until, of course, the destruction of uh, the, the kingdom, the southern kingdom, by Babylon, and continued all the way through, uh, basically, uh, down through 582, a few years after the captivity had begun. And then we lose track because we have no time frame for his death, so we simply say that he prophesied from about 627 down through 586, possibly a few years after that, 582, 580. So on the whole, about 2,600 years ago uh, from now, which is 2023, back to 600 or so BC. And we have there the magnificent prophecies, really all through the book of Jeremiah and Isaiah, as, we, as well as others of the shorter prophets, as we have noted, and even the book of Daniel, and even some express prophecies of the Lord's second coming in the book of Zechariah. So the Old Testament is filled with prophecies, Isaiah 52 and 53, of the week of passion of the Lord Jesus Christ. But here we see in Jeremiah some very fascinating things. We've already noted several, and what I mentioned in this connection uh, was the fact that we have sometimes actually prophecies that, uh, let's see if I have, still have that up, I guess I took that off. Uh, we have, I think it's Isaiah 9, uh, I believe it's uh, 9, 6, and 7, where we have uh, the prophecy of the first advent of Jesus Christ, and then uh, that's in verse 6 and verse 7, is that right? And uh, I had that in the last hour, uh, verse 7, the second advent. So sometimes within one sentence or two, two, two verses, we have the first and second advent. Sometimes we have a prophecy that is fulfilled uh, in the immediate future of the writing. Sometimes the immediate and also a far distant future uh, result that is prophesied. Such is the case in Jeremiah and Isaiah in many places. There seems to be some immediacy to many of the prophecies, but in 30 and 31, as many of the commentators suggest, none of these or many of these were not fulfilled in the time uh, of the return 
from the Babylonian captivity in 586 BC. Some of them could only pertain to the future, such as we noted in chapter 31, uh, where we see that uh, the prophecy of the new covenant that would come into being, and that, of course, prophecy was fulfilled by Jesus Christ ratifying that covenant during the communion service or the Passover, what we call the Last Supper, that he celebrated with his disciples. And that's in Jeremiah 31, 31 and following. But I wanted to go back and backtrack to the earlier part, which is in chapter 30. Uh, let's see. Yeah, chapter 30. And I uh, wanted to start in chapter 30 and look at the run-up of the prophecy. So we're going to do what we call rapid exegesis. So strap on your thinking cap. That's what one of my teachers used to say, I think, in elementary school. I don't think they use that anymore because I don't think anybody puts on their thinking cap, sadly, in the educational system. But in those days, they meant, you know, buckle up because we're going to get some heavy teaching here in math or science or literature or grammar or something like that. We used to study those in school, you know. At any rate, Chapter 30 begins this way, the word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, write all the words which I have spoken to you in a book. <laughs> and so he did. Uh, 52 chapters, in fact. Uh, we're in chapter 30 here, but he's got another 22 chapters to go uh, to the end of the book. And the last chapter, perhaps, was written by others because we have the last of the words written by Jeremiah in 51. But 52 chapters, even if it's just 51, that's a lot of print. And he was to do that, and so he did. For behold, days are coming. Now, days are coming here, declares the Lord, uh, when I will restore the fortunes of my people Israel and Judah. We noted in chapter 31 that the, uh, the fact that in the future, Judah and Israel will no longer be divided. This, of course, has been prophesied elsewhere, including in Ezekiel 37, <clears throat> uh, where it talks about the two sticks that would become one in his hand. One stick was referring to the northern kingdom, the other the southern kingdom. So we see that here he's referring prophetically uh, to Israel and Judah. Now the whole nation, the whole nation of Israel uh, is called Israel, but the southern kingdom was sometimes called Judah because after the captivity, only the largest tribe, Judah, had remained. And uh, of course, the smallest tribe, Benjamin, in the southern kingdom with Judah. So they became, uh, the southern kingdom was called Judah. Later, of course, that name was applied to all of the Hebrew people, and they were called Judahites, uh, Judahites, or Jews for short. And that's where the term Jew came. But of course, the Hebrews uh, included more than the tribe of Judah. The northern kingdom were the other uh, 10 tribes. And of course, they were called, uh, in many cases, Israel, which retained the name from uh, uh, the uh, founding father, Jacob, whose name was changed. All right, so the fortunes then. So this refers to more than just the return from Babylon, I submit, as do most of the commentaries as well. The Lord says, I will bring them back to the land that I gave to their forefathers, and they will possess it. They did then. But according to the Abrahamic covenant, they're going to possess much more than just the land that we call Israel today, or even after they return from the captivity at any time in history. They've never had all the land promised to Abraham from the Mediterranean all the way to the uh, Euphrates River, about 180 to 200,000 square miles. It's all going to belong to them. And I suspect, although much of it's desert today, in the future, it's going to be fertile land. God is going to totally renovate that whole area. Now, these are the words which the Lord spoke concerning Israel and concerning Judah, both kingdoms. For thus says the Lord, I have heard a sound of terror, of dread. There is no peace. Ask now and see if a male can give birth. Well, I don't know. We're thinking maybe that's possible today. But according to the Bible, that is just, that is impossible. And so can a man give birth? 
Uh, why do I see every man with his hands on his loins as a woman in childbirth? It's kind of like the hands hanging down like, oh, woe is me. Oh, things are terrible. And so he hangs down his hands like a woman in pain uh, from childbearing and so forth. And so it says, uh, uh, why have all the faces turned pale? Alas, for that day is great. There is none like it. And it is a time of Jacob's trouble, but he will be saved or delivered out from it. Now, this brings up the whole future tribulation, uh, the time of Jacob's trouble, as many prophetic teachers and scholars would tell us, has a reference to the future tribulation. And of course, we see this mentioned elsewhere, but primarily here and in one other passage over in Jeremiah 2, 27 and 28. We'll look at that in just a moment. Uh, but he will be delivered from it. Now, what does that mean? Well, it means that during that future tribulation, by the way, future to our day, I'm assuming that I'm teaching to those who understand dispensationalism, even though you may not believe it, the Bible is only clearly understood in a dispensational framework. We are in the age of the dispensation of the church, followed by the seven years promised of the 490 years in the prophecy of Daniel to Israel. They've had 483, there's seven years to be completed. For Israel, we believe those are the seven years of the future tribulation. And those who are Hebrew people who have not receive Messiah as their Savior before that time, during that time, either will die uh, as uh, unbelievers, even though of the Hebrew line, or they will accept their Messiah. By the end of that seven years, all Israel that's still alive will uh, remain and be delivered into the millennial kingdom to repopulate the kingdom uh, at that time, at least with Hebrew people. There will be Gentiles in the millennium. Many of those will be saved during that terrible tribulation time. We have studied it. We've talked about these things in the past. It is loosely called here the time of Jacob's trouble and the fact that they will be saved here from it. Uh, the preposition in Hebrew is min, M-I-N, which means from, away from. The Greek translation in the Septuagint is actually apo, A-P-O, which means out from the ultimate source, which means that they will be in the tribulation, but delivered out from it, in that they will be saved and taken into the millennial kingdom. And so we have that. And before I go on, let's hold the place here in Jeremiah 30 and go back to Jeremiah chapter 2 because these prophecies come up again and again and in the book of Jeremiah early in chapter 2 verse 27 and 28 but let's begin in 27 Jeremiah 2 26 I'm sorry I want to begin in 26 <clears throat> as the thief is shamed when he is discovered you know, I mean, you've seen enough cop shows on television, and uh, and when the thief is discovered, or in Perry Mason, or if you're that uh, ancient that you remember those, the guy, oh no, I did it, I should have, and then he makes some excuse why he did it, you know. When he's discovered, he's shamed. So the house of Israel is shamed. They, their kings, their princes, and their priests, and their prophets, they've all been shamed. Who say, uh, to, who, who say to the tree, you are my father. <laughs> uh, making fun here. This is God's sense of humor. It's tragic. But people who say to the tree, you are my father. These are the uh, ecology folks who uh, go out and hug a tree and talk to the fl flowers and talk to the um, talk to the animals too. But, you know, and so they worship the trees. They worship the animals. They talk to the tree. You are my father. And they go to the stone. You gave me birth. You know, I came out of the ground. I'm just, I'm just a slime come out of the ground. But not only that, they say they came out of a stone. And so they have a stone statue. They're all over the world. All kinds of stone statues. You know, we've got them on Easter Island and all these different places, statues of the God or gods that they believed in. And they claim that they were where they were born from a stone. My father was a tree and uh, uh, my birth came through a stone for they have turned their back to me, God says, and not their face. 
We need to face God because we are in Jesus Christ. We can come at the rapture face to face in the very presence of Jesus Christ. Right now we can have access into the throne room of God because we're seated at the right hand of the Father in Christ Jesus. We are face to face through the Holy of Holies, face to face in the presence of God. And so it says here, uh, not their face, but we will. But in the time of their trouble, this is Jacob's trouble that's mentioned over here in Jeremiah 30, verse 7. In the time of their trouble, they will say, arise and deliver us. Now remember in the Old Testament, the word save, as in the New Testament, mostly does not refer to eternal salvation uh, as an momentary decision to believe in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, or to believe in Jesus. Most of the times the word is used, the word salvation or save is used to refer to physical deliverance from adversity, disease, pestilence, military overthrow, deliverance in some physical sense. Now the Jews during the tribulation or the Israelites living then will be born again, they will be saved, but they'll also be delivered into the millennial kingdom. So it has a double unton, a double meaning, saved, born again, and saved, delivered into the kingdom. Here it says these people will arise in the time of Jacob's trouble, certainly if not during the first half of the seven years of tribulation, during what's called the great tribulation, those last three and a half years, all Israel will believe and will be delivered into the millennial kingdom unless they have been martyred for their faith. As a matter of fact, some of them are under the altar and they're saying, oh Lord, how long is this going to take? We're ready and they're waiting for the time for the Lord to begin the millennial kingdom. But where are your gods which you have made for yourself? Let them rise up if they can save you in the time of your trouble. For according to the number of your cities are the gods of Judah. In other words, you make gods, and as many cities as you have, every city has its own god. And as we go back into antiquity, we see that the multiplicity of gods goes into the thousands, if not hundreds of thousands or millions. Man has a propensity for creating gods in his own image or in the image of animals or even things such as trees and rocks and stones and it's amazing that people will believe in the most nonsensical things but when you present the gospel and the bible to these people oh no i can't believe that i worship this tree over here i worship this stone over here but i can't believe in the bible oh no i believe in flying saucers i believe in the aliens but oh no i can't believe in the word of god that says for the Lord has said, God has said, write this in a book, and we have that information. We have the very word of God from Genesis to Revelation. We don't have to worship sticks and stones and beasts and aliens, of course, who are angels at best and at worst fallen angels and demons. All right, let's go back now where we left off in Jeremiah 30, verse 7. And it shall come about in that day, declares the Lord of hosts, that I will break his yoke from off their neck. Who is his? His here is Satan. Satan has a yoke and his minions, his demons, and all those who sponsor and support Satan. I will break his yoke from off their neck and will tear off their bonds and strangers will no longer make them their slaves. Now that's not true after the uh, return from Babylon because many Jews were made slaves after that. This clearly has a future fulfillment beyond the return from Babylon uh, and the exile. But they shall serve the Lord their God, and here is a clinker, and David their king, whom I will raise up for them. David will reign. Now people say, well, this is simply a metaphor for the Lord Jesus Christ. Could be. But there's no reason in the passage to assume that it's not literally David. It doesn't say one like David will rule. It says David. David's dead now. How is it that he's going to reign in the future? How could he reign in 586 BC? He was long dead by then. This has to be future. And it has to be at the second advent when King David will have a resurrection body and be actually, as part of his rewards, 
reigning over Jerusalem. Now, Jesus Christ will reign as King of kings and Lord of lords, but many will be rewarded with authority and rulership. It talks about that for us. We will even rule over angels during the kingdom. We'll judge angels. Can you believe that? And therefore, we ought to be able to judge the smallest court cases uh, and do them fairly. At any rate, David, their king, whom I will raise up, resurrect David. Not one like David could easily say that. We have particles that indicate in the same way, not found here. And the rule of interpretation is when a word or passage is seen as not having a metaphoric sense in the context, it is to be taken literally. There's no reason here to take this as anything other than the resurrection of David. Well, that's certainly yet future. And even in this time, David wasn't around. Now, this is 600 BC, for heaven's sake. David's long dead by, a thousand, by 400 years approximately. So how is it that David, their king, uh, the Lord doesn't know. Well, excuse me, Lord, David's long dead. Jeremiah said, no, David's going to rise up. And fear not, O Jacob, my servant. Jacob, of course, uh, was the name uh, before it became Israel. Jacob is his, <laughs> we might say his, uh, I don't know, I, wanna, I don't want to say unsaved, uh, but his unspiritually uh, growth uh, name, shall we call that, uh, Israel. So he's called here, uh, so it says here, O Jacob, my servant, declares the Lord, and do not dismay, O Israel. That was his name later. That's the name of the whole group, both Judah and Israel. For behold, I will save you from a distance. This is deliverance. God is going to restore Israel to their nation. Holy smokes. That's, uh, you know where holy smokes comes from? The Shekinah glory. <laughs> holy smokes, not cigarettes. Holy smoke. The Lord is going to uh, come back and uh, he's going to bring Israel back. And that happened in 1948. And it's still going on today, and it will continue on until the time of Jacob's trouble. And your offspring from the land of their captivity, Jacob shall return and shall be quiet and at ease, and no one will make him afraid. Are any Hebrew people afraid today? I think they are. Have they been since the time of Babylon? I think so. How about in the time of Domitian and the Roman emperors uh, and the destruction of the temple? I think that they've been persecuted. This says that it's not going to happen. They'll be at ease and uh, no one will make them afraid. For I am with you, declares the Lord, to deliver you. Yes, to save, born again, but to deliver you from adversity in the tribulation. And I will destroy completely all Notice the word all. The nations where you have been scattered, uh, where I have scattered you, not, but where I have scattered you. The Lord is the one that scattered Israel among the nations. Only I will not destroy you completely. That is, he scattered them, but he hasn't destroyed them completely. And during the tribulation, there will be purging of Israel. And many will be purged during that time. But of course, those who are born again, will be delivered into the kingdom. So he says, I will not destroy you completely, but I will chasten you. There's the purging during the tribulation of Israel. And I will by no means leave you unpunished. You're going to get some discipline as a nation. I think that Israel is still under discipline even today. And in the tribulation, until the time, at the end of Jacob's trouble, that last three and a half years, when all Israel will be born again, who are still alive, and will be delivered. Dr. Fruchtenbaum concurs uh, in that presentation that all Israel that's left will become believers in the latter half of the time of Jacob's trouble. Okay, so I want to, and by the way, this idea of saving, I want to digress just a minute again here. I'm hoping I can finish this today. So much to cover. I know. I was thinking about how could I teach this during the communion service? Well, we ran about four minutes over, and here I am in the second hour, and we're still getting there. But this is so rich, and this leads up to 31, Jeremiah 31, and the communion service. So it is very important. So let's turn. Uh, I want to go back to uh, towards the end, Joel. Towards the end, the shorter prophets, Joel, Amos, Hosea, so Hosea, and then Joel. Joel chapter 2, 
Here we have a prophecy in this very short uh, book by Joel, considered a minor prophet, but it's certainly not lesser in any means at all. And here it says, and it will come about in verse 28, after this, that's the time of the tribulation he's talking about, I will pour out my spirit on all mankind, and your sons and your daughters will prophesy. There will be prophesy at the second advent, I believe, uh, perhaps of a third testament that God will give to us because there will be prophecy. What would they be prophesying about? The eternal state after the millennial kingdom because we know what's going to happen in the kingdom. Uh, it's spelled out in detail in Ezekiel 40 to 48. So it must be additional prophecies. And then it says, your old men will dream dreams, your young men will see visions, and even on the male and female servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. Sounds like filling of the spirit again. In fact, the apostles use this to reference the filling of the spirit and the indwelling of the spirit at Pentecost. And that was one fulfillment. But there's going to be another fulfillment at the end of the tribulation. And then he says, I will display wonders in the sky and on earth, blood and fire and columns of smoke. Uh, that hasn't happened, by the way. The sun will be turned into darkness and the moon into blood. We had a couple of books written on the blood moons and, oh, the Lord is going to come. This is in the tribulation. Those books are all bogus. There are blood moons, but this one's going to be different. The stars are going to fall, columns of smoke, the moon, the sun will be turned to darkness before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. That's the second advent at the end of the tribulation, that time of Jacob's trouble. And listen to this. And it will come about that whoever calls on the name of the Lord. This is quoted in the New Testament. This is not a call to be born again. This is a call to be physically delivered. These people, of course, in the tribulation are saved Jews. And they're calling on the Lord, deliver us, deliver us. And he does. They call on the name of the Lord and they will be delivered. I love the New American Standard. They don't use the word saved here. Even they recognize this is the physical deliverance of Israel into the Millennial Kingdom, and they will be delivered. When? Second Advent. For on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, there will be those who escape. We've studied the Tribulation. We've studied the Armageddon campaign. At the end of the Armageddon campaign, the victory celebration is on Mount Zion. And on Mount Zion, we have will be there in resurrection body. The Lord will be there and Israel will escape there. Uh, those who are left as Antichrist is defeated in Jerusalem by Jesus Christ at the second advent. And so those on Mount Zion in Jerusalem and those who will escape, as the Lord said, even among the survivors whom the Lord calls or invites. Who? That one's just stuck in there. And you can put that right in there in verse 7 uh, and also... Uh, later down in verse 10, saved. We have saved three times in verse 7, in verse 10, and again in verse 15. And so we'll continue reading. I will save you from afar, your offspring from the land of captivity. Jacob will return and no one will make you afraid. I am with you, declares the Lord, to deliver you. I will destroy completely all the nations which at where I have scattered you, only I will not destroy you completely, but I will chasten you justly, and you will by no means go unpunished. All right. How much is our time? <laughs> Check it out. All right. I'll go over to verse 18 of chapter 30. Thus says the Lord. This is God speaking. Behold, I will restore the fortunes of the tents of Jacob. And have compassion on his dwelling place. The city shall be rebuilt on its ruins. And the palace, that's the temple, shall stand in its rightful place. That will be the tribulation temple. And from there shall proceed thanksgiving. And the voice of those who make merry or joy. And I will multiply them and they will not be diminished. And I also will honor them and they shall not be insignificant. They're going to be the reigning people the ruling people during the millennium and Jerusalem will be the capital of the world. Their children also shall be as formerly and their congregation, the assembly, shall be established before me and I will punish all their oppressors. Second advent, 
victory in the Armageddon campaign by Jesus Christ. Who? And their leader. Now guess who that would be. That's the Lord Jesus Christ in resurrection body coming back to defeat Antichrist and win the victory and have the celebration on the Mount, uh, Mount Zion as we noted in Joel 2. And their leader shall be one of them. <laughs> Jesus is Jewish. He's of the line of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob all the way down through David. Their leader is one of them. And their ruler shall come forth from their midst. Born of the virgin. Here he is. And I will bring him near, that is to God, and he, they should capitalize the he there. They missed that one. New American Standard should capitalize. And he, Jesus Christ, shall approach me. Jesus Christ entered into the third heaven after resurrection, and he sits down at the right hand of the Father saying, mission accomplished, victory is won. He approached me, and who should dare to risk his life to approach me? Question, ha, huh. The Lord Jesus Christ is the only one that can approach. Oh, that's the answer to the question, declares the Lord. And you shall be my people, and I will be your God. Behold, the tempest of the Lord. This goes back to the trib. Wrath has gone forth, a sweeping tempest. It will burst on the head of the wicked, and fierce anger of the Lord will not be turned back until he has performed and until he has accomplished the intent of of his heart, the fulfillment of the destruction of the beast and Antichrist and the victory and the ushering in of the millennial kingdom. And it says here, in the latter days, are we there? Yeah, you will understand them. <laughs> oh boy, in the latter days, you will understand this. I think we got it. Chapter 31, at that time, declares the Lord, I will be the God of all the families of Israel, and they shall be my people. Thus says the Lord, the people who survived the sword of the tribulation found grace in the wilderness. Well, that was back in the time of Moses in the exile, uh, in the time of Moses in the wilderness, but also uh, from the time of Babylon. And here it is prophetic of the future. The Lord appeared to him from afar, saying, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, I've drawn you with my mercy, loving kindness. And then it says again, I will build you and you shall be rebuilt, O oh, virgin of Israel. Again, you shall take up your tambourines and go forth to the dances and the merrymakers. Again, you will plant vineyards on the hills of Samaria. The planters shall plant and they will enjoy them. For there shall be a day when watchmen on the hill of Ephraim shall call out, Arise, let us go up to Zion to the Lord our God. That's the worship in the tabernacle at the time of the millennial kingdom. And they'll have a trumpet. Da -da -da, time to go up to celebrate the feasts in Israel. And they will celebrate as they did before in the time of Moses and later into the prophets. For thus says the Lord, sing aloud with gladness for Jacob. Sing. They're going to sing like never before. And shout among the chiefs or the leaders of the nations. Leaders who are saved will be leaders of the nations, perhaps some of us in resurrection body during that time. Proclaim, give praise, and say, O oh Lord, deliver thy people, the remnant of Israel. Not all, but the remnant. Behold, I am bringing them from the north country, and I will gather them from the remote parts of the earth, among them the blind and the lame, the woman with child, and she who bears his labor, in labor with child together, a great company, they shall all return here. With weeping they shall come, but and with supplication I will lead them. I will make them walk by streams of water. Remember the 23rd Psalm. I lead them beside the still waters, and he's going to lead them by the streams of water on the straight path. Ah, the straight and narrow path, teaching righteousness in the kingdom, in which they shall not stumble in the millennial kingdom. For I am a father to Israel, uh, and Ephraim is my firstborn. And so we have that one. And then it says here, Hear the word of the Lord, O nations, and declare in the coastlands afar off. Then it was the area around the Mediterranean. Today it would be the entire world. And declare and say, he who scattered Israel will gather them and keep him as a shepherd keeps and keep him as a shepherd keeps his flock. He will keep Israel. And the Lord has ransomed Jacob 
and redeemed him. We studied about the cup of redemption that Jesus drank and said, this is the new covenant in my blood. He is the one who redeemed Israel from the land of him who is stronger than he, Babylon in the past, Antichrist in the future. And they shall come and shout for joy on the height of Zion. That's the victory celebration at the end of the time of Jacob's trouble, the end of the three and a half years, just prior to the millennial kingdom and the entrance into the kingdom. And they shall be radiant over the bounty of the Lord. Of course, the radiance of us will be, obviously, resurrection body. Over the grain and the new wine and the oil and over the young of the flock and of the herd. And their life shall be like a watered garden. And they shall, listen to this, never languish again. Never languish again. Well, we're just about out of time. We do have a little bit of time left. So that brings us back full circle now to Jeremiah 31, 21. If you were with us in the first hour today, we went through Jeremiah 31, 21, telling them, make sure you put boundary marks uh, from where you were taken into Babylon. Put those boundary marks so you know when you come back, this is where we're going to go. We're going to go back to Jerusalem. And so they did after the captivity. And in 1948, so they did. And they continue to go back even to this day, and they've got the markers of what is Israel and what is Jerusalem. And then we noted in verse 22, a prophecy, I believe, of the Lord Jesus Christ, God creating a new thing. Verse 22, a new thing in the earth, a woman here, Mary is her name, we know, because of fulfillment of prophecy, will encompass a man, but not just a man. The Hebrew word is gibbar. Hebrew has Adam, which is a man, that was Adam, and it has Ish, Ish and Isha, the man and the woman in the garden. This is not Ish, this is not Adam, this is Givor. A Givor is a warrior, a soldier, a mighty man, and so this woman encompasses a warrior. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. This is a prophecy of that. And then, of course, he continues on and discusses it, as we have noted, and we saw the fact in verse 29 that we had a problem there that the people of Israel would often say, oh, we're being punished because of our fathers. They were bad and they did terrible things and we're getting the repercussions. And that's where the expression, the fathers have eaten sour grapes <laughs> and the children's teeth are on edge. And so that was kind of, wah, wah, wah. Uh, we're, we're having discipline from God because our fathers were bad. And he says, every tub stands on its own bottom. What he said, of course, is everyone will die for his own iniquity. Each man who eats sour grape, his teeth will be set on edge. In other words, God allows each person, even in the four-generation curse, each generation has a choice. They can follow their father's stupidity and error, or they can say, no, I and my family and my house, we will serve the Lord. That's what Joshua said, you'll remember. At any rate, then we went to the great passage, the new covenant for the house of Israel. We read through that. We read through the six I wills. If you weren't here first hour, I leave that to your study. Let's pick it up then for the last few verses. Verse 35, thus says the Lord, who gives the sun for light by day and the fixed order of the moon and the stars for light by night. I could spend an hour on that. People say, well, the stars are all moving away and the constellations that were there uh, before the flood, they're different than they are now. They were not. They may be moving away at the speed of light, but they maintain their same position relative to other stars so that the zodiac and the stars that portrayed the gospel of Jesus Christ are going to be the same at the end of the millennium and in new eternity as they are right now because they're fixed. The stars for light, the fixed order of the moon and the stars for light by night who stirs up the sea so that its waves roar. The Lord of hosts is his name. If this fixed order changes, in other words, the stars start moving around and the uh, moon's no more and these things disappear, so-called destruction of the universe, not going to happen. Renovated, yes, not going to be depart, not going to be departing because it's fixed. And if it happens before me, says the Lord, then the offspring of Israel shall also cease from being a nation before me forever. 
That's not going to happen. Israel's going to reign for a thousand years and beyond. They're not going to be. They're not going to be cast off. He says, if the stars can move out of their place, the moon, and the sun disappear, then Israel will disappear. So it can't happen. Then he says, thus says the Lord, if the heavens can be measured. Now oh, we're trying to do that every time we find a new telescope. Oops, uh, the universe is larger than we thought. It's getting bigger. Oh no. It just keeps going. We can't figure it out. Well, how did it happen? Oh, the Big Bang. Oh, that's been discredited how many times? The evolutionists go crazy. They have no idea. They can't measure the universe. Barely can measure our own solar system and the Milky Way. Heavens above cannot be measured, God says. And the foundations of the earth search out below. You can't even figure out what's in the earth. There was a movie one time, Journey to the Center of the Earth. Uh, if you journey to the center of the Earth, you'd be cooked. It's molten iron. You can't figure that out. And thank God it is because it keeps the Earth protected from cosmic rays and so many other things that God has instilled into this marvelous planet. We can't even begin to figure it out. The foundation of the Earth searched out below. Then he says, if you can figure that out and you can measure the universe and the heavens and if the stars move out of place, he says, then I'll cast off the offspring of Israel. If you can, I won't. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when the city shall be rebuilt for the Lord from the tower of Hananiel to the corner gate. I don't have time to go through the gates of the Jerusalem. These are the postmarks at that time of Israel's city, Jerusalem. This is the whole northern wall, the tower of Hananiel to the corner gate, going from east to west. And the measuring line shall go forth straight ahead to the hill of Garab. Then it will turn to Goa. These, of course, is the turn to the south that occurred uh, in this time, measuring Jerusalem and the whole valley of the dead bodies. That's when we get to the south, the valley of Hinnom. Uh, this, of course, was the name that was used for the future lake of fire in the valley of Hinnom. And therefore, they called it Gehenna. The lake of fire. It was where all the dead bodies were buried south of Jerusalem. We find another gate there called the Dumb Gate. Very good name for it. And the ashes and all the field as far as the brook Kidron were going across the south to the corner of the horse gate towards the east shall be holy to the Lord. The horse gate at that time was the outer gate. Inside that was the eastern gate. So we're on the east side. So he circumscribed Jerusalem in that future time. God is going to still have a Jerusalem during the millennial kingdom. It says right here, it shall be holy to the Lord. It shall not be plucked up or overthrown anymore. Notice the last word for ever forever jerusalem is the eternal city well whew, that is a powerful passage jeremiah 30 and 31 i hope that people go back and listen to these two messages the one the last hour period at uh, 10 o'clock and the communion service and this i've kind of retraced it back through there's more that can be said but obviously that's the best we can do in the time that we have so let us pray father god thank you again for another opportunity to study your word and father for that one person who may be here this morning without christ without hope without eternal life we want you to know god has a plan for you he sent his son jesus christ the god man undiminished deity into human history through the virgin birth he became a perfect human being, a sinless human being. The second Adam, if you will. Sin came into the world through Adam and his lineage. Sin was taken out of the world by one person, Jesus Christ, the God-man Savior. And right now, right where you sit, you can have everlasting life, forgiveness of sin, and a plethora of blessings and rewards forevermore, even to ruling during the millennial kingdom. If that doesn't motivate you, I don't know what will. And right now, right where you sit, you can simply say, I'm believing in Jesus Christ. Thank you that he's the God-man Savior, that he died for my sins, and that I have, by believing in him, everlasting life. Thank you, and you can put it into a prayer. Father, thank you for his death on the cross for me. I believe in Jesus Christ. That's the moment of your eternal salvation. For God so loved the world that he gave his uniquely called, his only born, humanly speaking, son, that whosoever anybody 
would believe in him, would not perish, be everlastingly separated from you, Father, but have everlasting life. Won't you do it before you leave? There's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. There's born again. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. John said that if you believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know beyond any shadow of a doubt that you have everlasting life. Won't you do it before you leave? Right now, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Father, thank you again so much for these incredible passages in the Old Testament. I pray that I've caused them in some measure to be brought to, to life for each of us as believers, that we see the importance of the communion service that was not just an isolated event that is part of the dispensation of the church, but it is a fulfillment of ancient prophecies from some 2,600 plus years before and speaks of a future in the kingdom. So it really is back to the future because we're going to share that with your son, Jesus Christ, forever. Thank you for these things, Father. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We pray all of this in the matchless and powerful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen and amen.